till I take a notion to move on. What's your business here? His challenging aspect didn't sit well with Thatcher, but he said mildly, minding my own. The man frowned and harumphed, but pointed down the sidewalk. Three blocks, take a right on Crockett, two blocks to Pecan, hook a left. Thanks. Thatcher brushed the brim of his hat with his fingertips and set off, but something about the man's manner compelled him to look back without being too obvious about it. Sure enough, the man was still watching him with a scowl of distrust. Thatcher couldn't account for it, but he didn't let it bother him over much. Pecan Street was appropriately named. Several of the trees shaded the front lawn of number 312. The house was white with black shutters. A lattice with red climbing roses was attached to one end of the deep porch that ran the width of the house. A picket fence enclosed the property like the frame around a picture of ideal domesticity. Where the fence and an inlaid stone walkway met, a sign hung from an iron post. On it, written in swirly black letters, Dr. Gabriel Driscoll. Dangling from it by two little brass hooks was another sign, out on call. Right off, Thatcher knew that he couldn't afford any room in this house. It was far too fine. He was seeking more humble accommodations. Just as he was about to turn away, the screened front door opened and a woman came out onto the porch holding a watering can with both hands. She tipped the spout toward some purple flowers that bloomed from a wicker stand next to the front door. Noticing him, she paused and broke a friendly smile. Hello? He removed his hat. Ma'am? She looked in both directions of the street, as though wondering how he'd come to be there, much as Laurel Plummer had done. She said, The doctor is out making house calls. I'm not in need of the doctor. I came to see about the room for Let. The smile with which she greeted him faltered. Oh. She bent down to set the watering can on the floor and wiped her hands on her apron as she straightened up. She was in the family way, pretty far along, if Thatcher were to guess. I had forgotten design still was there. She pronounced it design in an unmistakably German accent. We are no longer taking a lodger. Self-consciously, she smoothed her hand over her belly. Oh, well, it probably would have been too rich for my blood anyway. Thanks, all the same. He replaced his hat and made to leave when she blurted, Wait, I want to bring you something to thank you for inquiring. He gave a dry laugh. Ma'am, you don't owe me anything. No, wait, please. Her eager nodding persuaded him. Okay. She beamed a smile. Come up to the porch. I'll be right back. Leaving her watering can, she bustled inside. Thatcher pushed open the gate and went up the walk. He stopped at the bottom of the steps leading onto the porch and eased the duffel bag off his shoulder, setting it on the ground. Then he stood there, threading the brim of his hat through his fingers as he took a look around. The house across the street was comparable to Dr. Driscoll's in size and architecture and was obviously occupied by a snoopy neighbor. He noticed movement behind a lace curtain in one of the front windows before it dropped back into place. After a minute or two, the lady returned, pushing through the screen door, happily bobbing her head and making the blonde curls framing her face bounce. Fresh baked shortbread, come. He left his hat on top of his duffel bag and climbed the steps. She met him halfway across the porch and extended a plate to him. It was china and lined with one of those white lacy things. On it were two large squares of shortbread the aroma of which made Thatcher's stomach growl. He'd eaten the last of the cheese and crackers during his five-mile hike from the plumber's place, but they hadn't gone far. Are you Mrs. Driscoll? Mila Driscoll, yes. Thatcher Hutton. Mr. Hutton, please. She thrust the plate toward him. Thank you, ma'am. He took one of the squares from the plate and bit into it. It was soft, buttery, sweet, and still warm from the oven. He swallowed the bite. Delicious. My husband's favorite. Her face was round and rosy and shiny with perspiration, which she fanned with her apron. 
The cloth had red and yellow apples printed on it, bordered in a red ruffle. When she smiled, her whole face lit up. He thought about the tenth set of Laurel Plummer's features. He couldn't feature her smiling so unguardedly or wearing that cheerful apron. Your husband's office is here in the house? Front parlor, yes. She nodded toward a tall bay window that was both functional and ornamental. Do you help with his practice? No, better I don't. Her cheerful blue eyes took on a sad cast as she glanced behind him toward where he'd left his duffel, which was obviously U.S. Army issue. It showed the wear and tear of having been to war and back. Even before the States got into it, people of German descent were subjected to resentment and suspicion because of a foreign war they'd had nothing to do with. Mila Driscoll's accent was a giveaway to her heritage. Thatcher reckoned she'd experienced a taste of unfair ostracism. She didn't refer to the war or his obvious service. Instead, she asked him if he was moving to Foley. No, ma'am, just staying for a spell. During the last mile of his journey today, he decided that hitching a free ride in freight cars came with risks he was unwilling to take again. His best option at this point was to earn enough money to buy a train ticket to whatever stop would get him closest to the Hobson Ranch up in the Panhandle. Before going off to do Uncle Sam's bidding, Mr. Henry Hobson had told him, Don't get yourself maimed or killed over there. Your job here will be waiting on you when you get back. Thatcher had promised that he would be back, but the army had kept him in Germany for over a year after the armistice so his return had taken longer than he'd counted on. Now on his way, he was eager to get back to his former life. It was likely to take him a couple of weeks to earn enough to cover the cost of the train ticket and keep himself fed and sheltered, say a month at the outside. But he needed to be getting at it and find a place to bunk for however long he was here. He finished the shortbread. It sure was good, Mrs. Driscoll. Take the other. He hesitated, but reasoned she would be disappointed if he didn't. Besides, at his hungriest in the trenches, he'd sworn he would never again turn down food. Okay, hold on. He went down the steps to fetch a spare, clean handkerchief from his duffel so he wouldn't have to wrap the extra piece of shortbread in the bloody handkerchief he'd used to bandage his hand. When the treat was wrapped and tucked into his pants pocket, he said, Thank you kindly, ma'am. He hefted the duffel bag up by the strap and slid it onto his shoulder, then put on his hat. Do you know anybody in town with a spare room? Doesn't have to be fancy. Near the railroad tracks, room and board, big yellow house. I'll find it. I must remember to ask Mr. Hancock to remove design. It's not that conspicuous. I wouldn't have noticed it if someone hadn't told me where to look. Oh? Who was that? Lady named Laurel Plummer. Lives out a ways. Young woman with baby? That's right. I passed their place this morning. She gave me a drink of water. You're acquainted? Only one time I see her. Her baby girl had bad croup. She brought her to my husband for medicine. Little good it had done, Thatcher thought. How old's the baby? Infant, tiny. She held her hands apart, about the length of a loaf of bread. Poor Mrs. Plummer was very anxious. With reason. Living in such a squalid place couldn't be good for a sick baby. I didn't meet her husband. What's he do out there? No husband. Father-in-law. He scratched his chin with his thumbnail. That's so. Her husband... Shaking her head, Mila Driscoll tisked. He died. Huh. So it had been her father-in-law who'd had his shotgun at the ready. Thatcher hadn't let on that he'd seen him, but he'd caught sight of that side-by-side -side as the woman had disappeared into the shadows inside the shack. She told him her husband had come back from the war, and that must have been the truth if her baby was that young. He couldn't stop himself from asking... How long since her husband passed? Two months? Three? The story. She paused as though reluctant to gossip. Thatcher didn't encourage her to continue, but he hoped she would. 
He was itching to know why the elder Mr. Plummer was so trigger-happy. Maybe he was just overprotective of the recent widow and his sick granddaughter. Fair to say, too, that a stranger who showed up out of nowhere could be cause for concern to people who lived in such a remote spot. Mrs. Driscoll overcame her reticence. The story is that her husband took her and the baby to his old papa out there, then shot himself the same night. Jesus, no wonder she'd looked gaunt and wound up. Such a shame for her, Mrs. Driscoll said. Yes, ma'am, it is. They were quiet for a moment, then he said, I'd best see if they have any vacancies in that boarding house. Thanks again for the shortbread. You're welcome. Good luck to you, Mr. Hutton. He doffed his hat to her, and then, when he reached the street, he tipped it to the busybody who was still observing them from behind the lacy curtain. 7. The large house near the railroad tracks was indeed yellow. In its day, it might have been considered grand, but Thatcher figured the loud color was an attempt to draw attention away from the overall seediness of the place. If he planned to stay longer, he would have passed on it, but reminding himself that the quarters would be temporary and probably affordable, he pulled on the bell at the front door. Through the screen, he saw a woman walking toward him down the length of a long central hallway. He'd seen scarecrows that were more comely. As she neared, she slung a damp cup towel over her shoulder and peered at him through the mesh. Whatever you're selling, I ain't buying. Friendlier scarecrows, too. I'm not a salesman. He stated his purpose and asked if she had a vacancy. She shifted a toothpick from one side of her mouth to the other. You railroad? No, ma'am. Most of my boarders are railroad men. They rotate in and out. I don't plan on being here long term either. She pushed open the door and motioned him inside. Name's Arlita May. May's the last name. I got one vacant room, rents by the week. No refund if you cut out early. Three meals a day, but supper is cold and you serve yourself off the sideboard. She passed him a piece of paper on which was a badly typewritten list of house rules. He was allowed barely ten seconds to scan it before she took it back. Basically, no women, no liquor, no cussing, no fighting, no smoking in bed. I've got beans about to boil dry. You taking it or not? He took it. She went over to a cabinet, sorted through a drawer full of keys, and exchanged one of them for his first week's rent money. Third floor, number two. You can find your own way. She shuffled off down the hall from which she'd come. Thatcher climbed two sets of stairs to the third floor. Room number two met his expectations. The mattress on the rusty iron bedstead sagged in the middle. Water stains spotted the ceiling. The single window was cloudy with grime. He raised it to let in some fresh air. A set of sheets and a folded towel had been left on the bed. He took the towel with him into the bathroom midway down the hall, used the toilet, washed his face and hands, and returned to his room only long enough to hang the towel on the footboard to dry and to retrieve his hat. He descended the stairs and followed the aroma of cooking beans to the kitchen. Uh, Ms. May? She turned to him, scowling. Sorry to bother you. Is there a public stable in town? Old Man Barker's, north side of town, across the bridge. An advertisement for Goodyear Tires was painted on one exterior side of Barker & Son Automobile Parts and Repair. In front were two gasoline pumps, and even as Thatcher crossed the bridge, he could smell motor oil. Several vehicles were parked both inside and out of the open garage. One was being worked on by a young man in dirty overalls, no shirt. Mr. Barker? He's out back. Without even glancing at Thatcher, he hitched his thumb over his shoulder. Thatcher walked around the building and found an older man lying on his back beneath a milk delivery truck. He was banging metal against metal and cussing a blue streak. 
Mr. Barker? The man slid from beneath the truck and shaded his eyes against the sun. Yeah? That's your Hutton. He walked over, bent down, and extended his right hand. Never mind that, my hands are greasy. As Barker came to his feet, he pulled a red shop rag from the pocket of his overalls and wiped his hands. What can I do for you? You stable horses. Barker tipped his head toward a large barn about 30 yards distant. Stable, shoe, groom, whatever you need. I need a job. The older man scoffed and looked him over. Doing what? Whatever needs doing. You ever seen the inside of a stable, young man? Spent most of my life in one. Before being drafted, cowboying was all I ever did. I mustered out of the army a month ago in Norfolk, Virginia. I've been working my way back up to the panhandle. The Hobson Ranch? He posed it as a question to which Barker shook his head. Don't know it. South of Amarillo, along the Paladuro, I started working for Mr. Hobson when I was 11 years old. I'm handy with horses. That may be, Barker said, still looking unconvinced. But I ain't hiring. Thatcher glanced over his shoulder in the direction of the garage before coming back around. Looks to me like you've got more than you can handle on the automotive side of your business. For the next few weeks, I could relieve you of stable chores, free up you and your son to do the other work. That nitwit ain't my son. I'm the son. My daddy had a smithy in stables at this location for 40 years. Henry Ford changed that. I had to adapt or starve. Thatcher had figured such was the case. How many horses are you stabling? Currently, six. Plus four of my own that I rent out. And one ill-tempered bitch that a fella left here for me to break. Yeah, how's that coming? Barker shifted his jaw and spat into the dirt. Thatcher smiled. That ill-tempered, huh? I step in stallion. Owner won't hear of gelding him yet. Let me take a look at him. What for? Why not? Barker thought it over, then said, What the hell? I was tired of working on that clutch anyway. He kicked the front tire of the milk truck as he walked around the hood. Come on. Thatcher followed him around the far side of the large stable to a corral of respectable size, but confining to the bay stallion who was running along the encircling fence, making abrupt directional changes, bucking occasionally, demonstrating his anger and frustration over being pinned. When he sensed them coming toward the corral, he pinned back his ears and his nostrils flared. I had to put him out here. He kept the other horses stirred up especially the mares. Thatcher chuckled. I don't doubt it. He's a handsome devil, and he knows it. He was a large horse, 16 hands, perfectly formed. He had the classic black points and a deep red coat that would gleam if he were groomed. Thatcher propped his arms on the top fence rail and watched the stallion strut, tail high. Does the owner want him trained to race? To ride, Barker said, adding dryly, for longer than three seconds at a time. Thatcher smiled at the quip. Does he have a name? Ulysses. I'd be throwing my owner too. Thatcher shrugged out of his coat and draped it over the fence rail. How does a dollar and a half a day sound, Mr. Barker? Hold it. What are you doing? The stallion was snorting and eyeballing Thatcher as he unlatched the gate, slipped through it, and closed it behind himself. The horse didn't like any of it. He became even more agitated, picking up speed on his next go-around of the corral and coming dangerously close to Thatcher, who stood stock still. Barker said, Get out of there! You ain't even dressed for this! I had to leave my gear behind when I went into the army. But he doesn't know city shoes from boots. At least take this rope. Barker lifted a coiled lariat off the top of a fence post. Not for our first meeting. That bastard will kick you into next week. I'm mindful that he'd like to, but he also wants to know what I'm up to. I want to know what you're up to. Earning my buck fifty. Thatcher calmly walked to the center of the corral. 
I haven't agreed. Thatcher said, Mr. Barker, I don't want him to see me as a threat, but I do want his undivided attention. And no offense, you're a distraction. If you could back up a little, please. Thatcher heard Barker spit another wad of tobacco into the ground before muttering, Your funeral. There was a lot to be learned about the horse just from watching how he maneuvered. Thatcher faked indifference, but without appearing to, he studied the stallion's movements as he cantered along the fence, tossing his head, whinnying, stamping, making sudden shifts in direction, asserting himself. After several minutes, Thatcher spoke softly. Won't do you any good to keep that up. You'll wear yourself out before I leave this corral. He partially turned his back to the animal, remaining very aware of where he was, but intentionally keeping his head turned away from him, as though uninterested in his arrogant posturing. See, I'm not scared of you, and you don't have to be scared of me. It didn't take long. The horse slowed his gait and eventually came to a standstill. He stomped a couple of times, then turned toward the center of the corral to face Thatcher. Well, are we going to be friends? Thatcher made a nicking sound. Not yet ready to concede, the stallion shook his head. All right, stay there and think it over. I can wait. Sooner or later, your curiosity is going to get the better of you. Thatcher stayed as he was, acting nonchalant. Those mares you've got stirred up, are they pretty? The stallion's ears flicked forward. Thatcher made the nicking sound again. Slowly, the stallion walked toward him and came to a stop, head down. Good boy, we're making strides. Ulysses, huh? Guess you're stuck with it. The stallion snuffled and jerked his head when Thatcher reached up to stroke his forehead. But after one more rejected attempt, the horse allowed his touch. That a boy. Moving slowly, speaking softly, he praised the stallion's cooperation. As Thatcher rubbed the horse's neck, he looked over at Barker. A dollar and a half a day? Barker spat. Thatcher took that as a yes. After spending another few minutes smoothing his hands over the stallion, building trust, he left the corral and reclaimed his coat. Barker led him into the stable, introduced him to the horses and the stalls, and showed him where tack and supplies were kept. I'll have to borrow one of your saddles, Thatcher told him. Mine's at the ranch. Help yourself, what they're there for. As Thatcher was leaving, Barker told him there was a second-hand clothing store in town. You might find yourself a pair of boots, at least. Thatcher got directions to the shop, but it was closed for the day. He had planned on sending Mr. Hobson a letter tomorrow, telling him that he could start looking for him in about a month. In the letter, maybe he'd ask Mr. Hobson if he would send him his gear by train and take the expense out of his salary once he was back. He made it to the boarding house before the cold supper was cleared off the sideboard. After finishing his meal, he wandered out onto the porch where several other boarders were chewing the fat. Laconically, they all introduced themselves and shook hands, but he didn't get the impression that fast friendships were formed among them probably because of their transiency. One thumbed through a magazine. One was quietly playing a harmonica. Some puffed smokes. Thatcher noticed that one of the younger among them slid a flask out of his pants pocket, uncapped it, and took a sip. Another, an older man who had laid claim to a rocking chair, said, That's against house rules and against the law. Now that's a fact, the young man said. It is. Then, leaning toward the man in the rocker, he whispered, And teetotaling is against the laws of nature. He took another drink, then taunted the older man by smacking his lips and saying a long, drawn-out, Ah! Sensing the growing tension, the man with the harmonica stopped playing. The older man didn't let it drop. He said to the young man, I doubt you respect any rules. That's not so, the young man retorted. I set rules for myself. Such as? He seemed to ponder it, then snapped his fingers and said, I only get half as drunk on Sundays. 
The others on the porch were equally divided as to who thought that was funny and who didn't. The one in the rocking chair took umbrage. He excused himself, left the rocker, and stamped into the house, letting the screen door slap closed behind him. The younger man chortled. He's a barrel of laughs. Another man, who Thatcher had noticed earlier because of his sporty attire, left the corner of the porch where he'd been smoking in solitude and sidled up to the younger man. What's your name? Randy Wells. Who's asking? Chester Landry. He motioned to the flask. Where'd you get the booze? Randy cast a wary look around. When his gaze lighted on Thatcher, he squinted suspiciously. I feel like a stroll. He indicated for Landry to follow him. They went down the porch steps and set off across the yard, talking softly together. No one said anything for a moment, then the harmonica player picked up his tune where he'd left off, and another commenced to talk about baseball. Thatcher stayed only a few minutes longer before going inside. He took a turn in the third floor bathroom, then went into his room, undressed, and took the piece of shortbread to bed with him. As he stretched out on the lumpy mattress, he released a sigh of relative contentment. It had been a damned long day, but he'd accomplished a lot too. For a start, he'd survived the fight in the freight car and the jump from it without serious injury. The miles he'd walked had fatigued him, but hadn't completely exhausted him, like the long marches he'd made through the French countryside, fully armed, cold, hungry, and hoping an enemy bullet didn't have his name on it. His landlady, Arlita May, was scary, but he had a roof. The mattress was bad, but still better than wet ground or the floor of the boxcar. He had a headstrong horse to train, and if he did that successfully, word would get around and more work could come from it, until he'd earned enough to get him the last few hundred miles to home. All things considered, he had it pretty good. He polished off a shortbread and licked the crumbs from his fingers before reaching up for the string attached to the bare bulb light fixture mounted to the wall above the headboard. When he closed his eyes, an image of Laurel Plummer came to mind. He fell asleep thinking about her in profile, the wind toying with her hair and holding her shapeless dress tight against her front. 8. Sheriff William Amos was awakened by the shrill ringing of his telephone. He squinted the clock into focus and cursed under his breath. Nobody called at three o'clock in the morning to impart good news. As he threw back the sheet and got up, his wife murmured sleepily. He patted her on the rump, then went to the downstairs hall where the telephone sat on a small table. He picked it up by the stand and lifted the earpiece from the fork, saying into the mouthpiece, Bill Amos. One of his younger, greener deputies identified himself. Hated to wake you, sir. I hated you did too. What's happened? He hoped for nothing more major than rowdy boys being caught painting naughty words on a public building, but he mentally ran through the list of better likelihoods. A still had caught a cedar break on fire, Rival moonshiners had gotten into a skirmish with fists, firearms, or both. Lawmen in a neighboring county, tired of chasing a notable bootlegger, were officially dumping him into Bill's jurisdiction. Even before prohibition had become federal law several months back, evangelicals had for generations voted in local laws that had kept many Texas counties dry. Thus, the illegal making and selling of corn liquor was the second oldest profession in the state. All the Volstead Act had accomplished so far was to turn the trade into an even more profitable enterprise. Demand was at an all-time high, production was up, competition was stiff, and the moonshiners in Bill Amos's county were among the most industrious in Texas. We've got a situation, sir, the deputy said. Something y'all can't handle? Thought so when we started out, but things has gone downhill fast. Bill heaved a sigh. Somebody must have wound up dead. Well, truth is, we don't know yet. What's that mean? He's either breathing or he isn't. Is he a Johnson? No, sir. It's Mrs. Driscoll. 
With a start, Bill angled his head back and looked at the phone as though the deputy had started speaking in tongues. Dr. Driscoll's wife? Mila Driscoll? Yes, sir. She's gone missing. Ten minutes later, Bill entered the sheriff's office, where Dr. Gabriel Driscoll was carrying on like a crazy person. Usually of an austere nature, the physician was clearly unhinged. His hair was standing on end, as though he'd been trying to tear it out. He was pacing in circles and aggressively warding off anyone who attempted to restrain or calm him down. When he saw Bill, he lunged toward him. Sheriff, do something. You've got to find her. Bill hung his hat on a wall rack. Get us some coffee, he said, addressing one of his deputies, who looked relieved to be charged with something besides the physician. I don't want any coffee. Gabe made an arrow of his right arm, pointing to the door through which Bill had just entered. Get out there and find my wife. Gabe, I can't help you if you don't help me. First off, you gotta get hold of yourself. He pulled up a chair. Sit down and tell me what's happened. I've told them. The doctor indicated the several deputies, watching him with a mix of pity and wariness much like they would regard a wounded wild animal that hadn't yet died. I need to hear everything for myself, Bill said. So take a breath and brief me on the situation. He came and took her, he shouted. In brief, that's the situation. Then, as though feeling the impact of his own declaration, he collapsed into the chair, planted his elbows on his knees, cupped his bowed head with all ten fingers, and began to sob. What if it was your wife, Bill? God knows what he's doing to her. Who's he talking about? Bill asked, addressing one of his most trusted men, Scotty Graves. I talked to the old lady who lives across the street from the Driscolls. Oh, Miss Wise? Yes, sir. She said a man came to their house today, talked to Mrs. Driscoll up on the porch. Miss Wise recognize him? No, sir. And she said she knew a stranger when she saw one. The illogic of that statement caused Bill to run his hand over the top of his head. Maybe this stranger was sick and looking for the doc. The sign was out saying the doctor was on a call, but Miss Wise said this man stayed for several minutes. He didn't appear to be ailing either. He go inside the house? No, sir. Didn't go no farther than the porch. Mrs. Driscoll gave him something, but Miss Wise couldn't tell what it was. Something like what? Something small enough to fit in his pocket. A bottle of medicine, maybe? A jar of pills? We thought of that, but the doctor checked his medicine cabinet. Everything's accounted for. Besides, he keeps the cabinet locked when he's away. Even Mrs. Driscoll doesn't have a key. Did Miss Wise describe the stranger? Was he young, old, what? Young, no more than 30, she said. Tall on the slender side, dressed in a dark suit. He had dark hair. He was wearing a fedora, but he took it off while talking to Mrs. Driscoll. He was carrying a bag that looked heavy. Salesman's wares? Miss Wise didn't think so. She said it looked like the kind of bag a soldier would have. Soldier? That's what she said? Yeah, but she's more than half batty, Bill muttered. Anything else? She said he was cocky. How'd she get that? Did she talk to him? No, but he tipped his hat to her. Bill hooked his thumb in his gun belt. Maybe he was just being polite. She was watching from behind the curtain in her side parlor. Out of sight? She thought so, but apparently not. So, aware of being watched by a nosy neighbor, the young man had mockingly tipped his hat, making himself certain to be remembered. If he'd brought harm to Mrs. Driscoll, he was either incredibly stupid, or he was cocky, just like the old maid had said. Bill had rather him be stupid. Someone that cocky usually didn't give a damn, and that was dangerous. You boys have scouted the neighborhood? He asked his men at large. Scotty answered for the group, questioned all the nearby neighbors, searched every outbuilding for blocks around, Mrs. Driscoll was well known. If anybody had seen her, it would have been noted. Nobody heard anything suspicious, shouting, barking dogs, nothing like that? 
Nothing out of the ordinary, no sir. What about Mrs. Driscoll's friends? Have you checked with them? The doc knew of only two people she might visit. One's the preacher of the Lutheran Church. He hasn't seen her since last Sunday service. The other was the local librarian, who'd told the deputy she hadn't seen Mila Driscoll in a while, but had reassured him that none of the books she'd checked out were overdue. What about her family? Bill asked. None closer than down around New Braunfels. Stands to reason. Stood to reason because it was a predominantly German town. Have you checked with them? Her parents are deceased. Doc said her uncle is the designated head of the family. We're waiting on a long-distance call to go through. Bill nodded absently and turned back to the doctor, who was still holding his head between his hands and moaning disconsolately. Okay. He waited until the distraught man looked up at him. Do you have any idea who this man was? No. Based on the description of him? It could fit a dozen men, Bill, a hundred. He was right, so Bill didn't press him. Mrs. Driscoll didn't mention having a visitor today? He came asking about lodging. We used to rent out a room. Did she appear afraid, apprehensive, upset? Even before he finished the question, the doctor was saying, No, no, she was her usual self. Maybe a little more subdued than usual, but I think she was sensitive to my mood. You were in a mood? Distracted. I ran a rural route today. One of my patients had gone into labor. The baby was breech. Her sister was with her. She told me she'd assisted in breech births before that she could handle it. I had several other people to see, so I left them. But I was worried about the danger to both the mother and child that a difficult delivery like that could be. It wasn't something I wanted to discuss with Mila, not with her being in her condition. As it is, she's nervous, this being her first. When's the baby due? Two more months. Bill took a deep breath. So she read your mood and was a bit subdued. Anything else out of the ordinary? No, we had supper. I went into my office and did some paperwork. She was crocheting. When did you last see her? Around 10 o'clock. We were getting ready for bed. I got an emergency call. The breach birth? No. He cast a nervous look around the room. Lefties, one of the uh, waitresses, got worked over by a customer. Bill took a visual survey of his deputies, who gave him various versions of a shrug. One said, First we've heard of it. Gert wanted it kept quiet, Gabe said. Lefty's was a roadhouse that had the best burgers within 50 miles, also the best whores. Sheriff Amos couldn't vouch for that personally, but that was the general consensus known by everybody. Lefty flipped burgers while his wife, Gert, oversaw the more lucrative side of the business. A ruckus of one sort or another was frequently incited by one of the waitresses. Inevitably, those incidents resulted in somebody bleeding. Bill reasoned that Gert wanted this incident kept quiet so not to draw the law's attention to the place. Bill was well aware of the copious amount of bootleg liquor now being served in Lefty's back room. He would need to get out there and deal with that, but it took a back burner to Mrs. Driscoll's disappearance. You took care of the girl? He asked Gabe. Yes. Is she going to be all right? In time? Can all this wait? The doctor's patience was fraying. Bill had to keep him centered. I've got to establish a timeline, Gabe. What time did you get home and discover Mrs. Driscoll gone? Late, on my way back into town, I stopped in to check on the breech birth. The baby had turned at the last minute. The delivery went fine. I checked out the mother and baby. His voice hitched. Well, my own wife and baby. Gabe. Bill spoke his name brusquely to keep him on track. What time did you get home? A little after one o'clock. I was exhausted but hungry. I made a sandwich and ate it before going upstairs. He looked down at his hands as though they held the answers. Mila wasn't in bed, not in the bathroom, 
I turned the house upside down, searched the yard. When I couldn't find her anywhere, I called here. That's it. When he looked up at Bill, his chin was quivering. She wouldn't have left on her own. I don't think so either, Bill said, briefly laying his hand on Gabe's shoulder. But let's not panic. Backtrack a little. Was she in bed when you left for the roadhouse? Yes, she wanted to get up and send me off with a thermos of coffee, but I wouldn't let her. She needed the rest. When you got home, was there any sign of a disturbance? Broken latch, anything like that? No. Scotty chimed in. We searched the house. Looked like nothing had been touched, no break-in. Led us to believe that Mrs. Driscoll let in whoever snatched her. Gabe Driscoll lunged to his feet. Are you implying that my wife invited... He's not implying any such thing, Gabe, Bill said. Sit down. I'm not going to sit down, he shouted. What's wrong with all of you? Why are you just standing around? Why aren't you out looking for her? She could be hurt, dying. She could be... Suddenly, the door was pushed open with a lot of impetus behind it. When Bill saw who filled the doorway, he thought, shit. Drolly, he said, Mayor. The Honorable Bernard Croft came inside and shut the door, bristling with self-importance. Bill, what in hell is going on? Is it true? Mrs. Driscoll is missing? On a good day, Bill resented the city officials meddling in the affairs of his department. The mayor had a way of creating a hullabaloo even when one wasn't warranted for his own aggrandizement. Bill asked, How'd you get wind of it? Miss Eleanor Wise called me. For what purpose? With condescension, Croft replied, For the purpose of saving Mrs. Driscoll from the man who abducted her, Bill. It hasn't been established that... Have you identified him yet? Until you blazed in and interrupted, I was compiling the facts of the case. How many facts do you need? Miss Wise described him to a T. Everyone in the room gaped at him. Bill included. What do you know about him? I know I mistrusted him on sight, he said. I was reluctant to send him over there to your house, he said, addressing Gabe. But the ad was right there in Hancock's window. Gabe placed his fingertips to his forehead. Ad? For the room? I'd forgotten it was there. He asked me for directions. Then, in a defensive tone, the mayor added, if I hadn't told him, the next person he asked would have. We stopped taking in a boarder a while ago, Gabe said. I'm sure Mrs. Driscoll explained that to him, which means he had to look somewhere else for a place to stay. Bill shouldered past the mayor and reached for his hat. Scotty, stay with Dr. Driscoll. The rest of you, let's go. Harold, bring a shotgun. Bernie, you can go on home. You'll need me to identify him. Seeing that Bill was about to object, the mayor added, Unless you'd rather take along Miss Eleanor Wise. 9. When Thatcher had fallen asleep, it never crossed his mind that he would be awakened by having a gun barrel jammed against his cheekbone. A German infantryman somehow had survived the no-man's land between his trench and the Americans and intended to chalk up at least one doughboy to his credit. Thatcher flung up his hand and slammed the barrel of the shotgun into the soldier's face. Flesh squished, cartilage crunched. The man hollered. Thatcher used that instant of the soldier's shock and pain to come up out of the bed and leap over the footrail where he barreled into another of the enemy, previously unseen. This one was stocky and strong, but Thatcher had enough momentum to drive him back against a wall. From behind, another wrapped his arms around Thatcher, pulled him off the stocky one, and wrestled him face down onto the floor. But there were more than just these three. Two others joined the melee. The five of them surrounded him, all shouting and grasping at him from every side, trying to secure his arms and legs. One had a hand on the back of his head, holding it down, his cheek against the floor. He fought them with savage will. 
They may shoot him, bayonet him, but he was not going to be taken prisoner by these bastards. He managed to throw off the hand holding his head down and escaped the other's hold long enough to flip onto his back. Instinctually, he thrust his hand straight up into the face of the man straddling him. He had a thick mustache and a white cowboy hat. Cowboy hat? There was a five-pointed star badge pinned to his shirt. Engraved on it, Sheriff. Jesus. The war was over. This wasn't France. He was back in Texas. The men surrounding him weren't German infantrymen, but he sure as hell had been in a life-or-death combat with them. Before he could surrender himself, the backs of his hands were flattened to the floor on either side of his head. He took stock of the men encircling him. They were all breathing hard from having exerted themselves to restrain him, but even at that, he didn't know what he'd done to warrant their judgmental bearing. They stared down at him with unsettling disdain. All were strangers, save one. Thatcher recognized the gold pocket watch chain strung across his vest. He was the most heavy set. Thatcher figured it had been him he'd crashed into and rammed into the wall. He was the first to speak. That's him, all right. You're sure? asked the one wearing the sheriff's badge. He planted his hand on the center of Thatcher's chest and pushed himself off him and to his feet. What have you got to say for yourself, young man? I woke up with a gun to my face. I was defending myself. Or resisting arrest. Arrest? The only light in the room spilled through the open doorway from the hall. These apparent lawmen cast long shadows across the bed and onto the ugly papered walls, enhancing the menace they conveyed. They meant business. Thatcher repeated, Arrest? What the hell for? You sure this is him, Bernie? Positive, said the man with the gold watch fob. I recognize him, and I recognize that bag. He had it with him. He motioned toward Thatcher's army-issue duffel bag, which he'd placed on the seat of the room's one chair after deciding last night that he could delay unpacking till morning. Gather up all his belongings, put them in the bag and bring it, said the sheriff. You bet. One of the uniformed men turned away to do his bidding. The sheriff said to another, Question everyone in the house. See if anybody knows anything about him. Yes, sir. That man edged past the footboard and left the room. Another moved forward and bent over Thatcher. His nose was bleeding. It and his eyes were beginning to swell. He was holding a shotgun, no doubt the one Thatcher had smacked into his face. The man grinned with malice. Thought you'd just drift into our town and haul off with one of our women? Think again, hotshot. Then he flipped the shotgun and smacked the butt of it against Thatcher's skull. The blow hurt like hell and made his vision go dark and sparkly for a moment, but it didn't knock him out. Hey, go easy, Harold, the sheriff said. We need him able to talk. He extended Thatcher his hand and helped him up. The man who'd struck him, Harold, watched smugly as Thatcher struggled to regain his equilibrium. He made blurry eye contact with the man he recognized by his gold pocket watch. He also was leering with self-satisfaction. I'm Sheriff Bill Amos. What's your name? Thatcher Hudden. The sheriff repeated his name as though committing it to memory, then gathered up the clothes Thatcher had hung on a wall hook before going to bed and passed them to him. Get dressed. After he did, he was handcuffed. Then, without further ado, the sheriff said, Let's go. Thatcher dug his heels in. I have a right to know what you're arresting me for. None of them seemed to think so. With the barrel of the shotgun against the base of his spine, he was prodded out of his room and into the hallway. It seemed that he was the only boarder in the house who'd been taken unawares by the arrival of the posse. Everyone else had emerged from their rooms, all in pajamas or underwear, watching as the procession trooped down the two sets of stairs. Few of them met Thatcher's gaze directly, but the smart aleck, Randy, who earlier had heckled the older man on the porch, winked at him. And when Thatcher passed the flashy dresser who'd introduced himself to Randy as Chester Landry, 
He gave Thatcher a sly, speculative look, as though they shared a dirty secret. The landlady stood at the front door, arms crossed over her bony chest, lips tightly pursed. Don't expect no refund on your rent. Once outside, the sheriff dispatched all the deputies except Harold to rejoin the search. Thatcher asked, the search for what? But again, he was ignored. When Harold manhandled him into the officially marked automobile, he was showy with the shotgun, but careless with his gun belt, which was within easy reach of Thatcher's cuffed hands. However, to go for the deputy's pistol would be foolhardy. They would soon determine that they had the wrong man and release him. Until then, he'd go through the process without making more trouble for himself. Mayor, I guess you'll have to ride with us, the sheriff said, and the man Thatcher had met outside Hancock's store, the mayor, climbed in along with them. Harold drove them to a single-story limestone building that headquartered the sheriff's department. No one said anything during the brief ride. When they piled out of the car, the sheriff gripped Thatcher's arm just above his elbow. Together, they entered the building. It smelled of cigarettes and scorched coffee. The main room was crowded with the standard desks, chairs, and filing cabinets of any law enforcement office. Wall-mounted gun racks were impressively stocked. Two large maps, one of the county, the other of the state, were tacked to the far wall, along with numerous wanted posters and a notice of a missing cow. Seated in side-by-side -side chairs were a man in a deputy's uniform and a man with a pale complexion, a dark five o'clock shadow, and wavy hair. The instant he saw Thatcher, he came hurtling toward him like he'd been shot from a cannon. If the deputy hadn't acted swiftly to restrain him, Thatcher thought for sure the man would have gone for his throat. Gabe, the sheriff barked. None of that business. Scotty, haul him back and keep him back. Yes, sir. Though the man resisted, the deputy managed to wrestle him back into the chair. The mayor went over to him and laid a hand on his shoulder. Found him, sleeping like a baby, Gabe. Can you believe that? Glaring at Thatcher, the man said, Has he told you where she is? Not yet, but he will. The mayor brusquely signaled the deputy, Scotty, up out of his chair. Then the mayor sat down in it. Thatcher... Wanting to ask what the hell was going on, thought better of saying anything just yet. Harold shoved him down into a chair. He pulled a handkerchief from his pocket and wiped at the blood dripping from his now misshapen nose. One of his eyes had almost swollen shut. Thatcher returned his glare with a mask of indifference and said, I still owe you for the clout on the head. The deputy gave him a fulminating look, but he walked away, slung Thatcher's duffel onto a table across the room, opened it, and began to paw through the contents. No longer wearing his hat, Sheriff Amos drew up a chair and stationed it in front of Thatcher's, pulling it close enough that Thatcher could see the individual whiskers in his thick salt-and-pepper mustache. He said, Son, save us all a lot of time and trouble. Tell us right now where Mrs. Driscoll is. 10. Laurel had been awake for most of the night, walking a fussy and feverish pearl around the shack, trying to soothe her infant, even as she fueled her resentment against Derby's selfish suicide, her present plight, her unknown future, and her absent father-in-law. She had whipped herself into a high snit by the time she heard his truck clattering up the incline shortly before dawn. As soon as he cleared the door, she lit into him. Where in the world have you been? He looked haggard and none too agreeable himself. That's my business. It's my business too. I was worried to death, afraid something had happened to you, in which case Pearl and I would have been stuck here. What have you been doing all night? She was accustomed to his being away most days, all day, often from sunup to sunset. This was the first time he had stayed away all night. Though she would rather die than own up to it, she had been afraid to be alone after the sun went down. With only a sliver of a moon, even the surrounding limestone hills had become indiscernible. She couldn't see the road from the shack. 
The darkness had been all-encompassing, except for the lantern she had kept burning all night. He plopped down on his seat on top of the barrel and rubbed his bad hip, wincing with discomfort. Mollifying her tone, she said, I saved you some cornbread and bacon. I ain't hungry. Laurel stood directly in front of him, making it impossible for him to ignore her. I believe I deserve an explanation, Irv. You kept me occupied half the day teaching you how to drive, trying to teach you how to drive. The series of lessons had been intermittent, carried out during Pearl's brief naps between bouts of coughing. Laurel had never sat behind the steering wheel of an automobile. The sequence of necessary steps one had to perform with both hands and feet had been more difficult to coordinate than she'd anticipated. She was right-handed, so naturally she'd reached for the crank with that hand when Irv had told her repeatedly to always use her left on the crank unless she wanted her damn arm broke. They had wound up being frustrated and fractious with each other. She asked now, Did you stay gone all night to punish me for not mastering how to drive? He gave her a withering look. What do you take me for? Then why didn't you come home? I had a project to finish up. In the middle of the night? How's Pearl? She's sick, Irv. What project? Putting up a wall inside an old house. It was just sold to a family moving here from Waco. The wife wanted to divide one room into two so that her daughter would have a space separate from her brothers. You're lying. He glowered and looked guilty at the same time. You went into too much detail, she said just like Derby did when he was lying. He got up and headed for the other side of the room, but she caught him by the arm. What? he asked, pulling his arm free. Do you have a... Is there a woman you see? He huffed a humorless laugh and continued on his way over to the sink, where he pumped water into a glass and took a long drink. Laurel waited until he'd turned back to her before quietly apologizing. I'm sorry. I had no right to ask that. It isn't any of my business. He gave that same dry laugh. I've loved only one woman in my lifetime, Derby's mama, and it damn near killed me to watch her die in misery. Don't go thinking I've got a romance going. No project either, I'm guessing. Looking done in, he returned to his seat and bent down to unlace his shoes. No, I had a project all right. He looked up at her from beneath his bushy eyebrows. That fellow that came here this morning. What about him? I don't know, and that's why I'm worried. What the hell was he doing way out here? I told you he... I know what he claimed, but I ain't buying it. I went around tonight, checked in with people I know, asked if they'd seen him. What people? People. She let his curt reply pass. Had anyone in town seen him? Nobody I talked to. He probably hitched a ride on the highway and is long gone. Maybe, he grumbled. But him snooping around gave me an itch I can't scratch. What snooping? He was lost and asking for directions, that's all. He gave a snort and focused his attention on Pearl, who Laurel had been holding against her shoulder, rocking gently. She'd slept through their conversation. You say the baby's sick? She's running a fever again. I want to take her back to the doctor. I saw him tonight. She stopped her swaying motion and looked at Irv with surprise. You went to see Dr. Driscoll? No, no. He was at the roadhouse. You know, the place where I pick up burgers on occasion. You told me it isn't a respectable place. It ain't, but Lefty Fry's a damn good burger, and he's also a fountain of information knows everything happening in and around here. I went to inquire about our visitor today. He didn't know anything? Said he didn't, but he was dealing with a problem of his own. One of his, uh, girls got crosswise with a customer. He beat her up pretty bad. Understanding dawned. It's that kind of place? It's full service, all right. Irv shook his finger at her. Don't you ever darken the door of it. It draws all sorts of lowlifes. The girls who work there, well, let's just say that 
Most are experienced and tough enough to take care of themselves. Lefty's wife, Gert, is the meanest of them all. When she saw her girl there, beat up and bleeding, she went after Wally, the guy who hurt her, with a meat cleaver. Lefty had to literally peel Gert off him. He turned him over to his cousins, them Johnsons, cavort in a pack, then tossed the whole sorry lot of them out. They called Doc Driscoll to come patch up the young lady. By the time he got there, Lefty had calmed Gert down. Some, it was quite a scene. Laurel listened with incredulity to Irv's account of the brawl and marveled at the matter-of-fact way in which he'd related it. She marveled even more to think of Dr. Driscoll's being in such a place. During her one brief meeting with the doctor, she had thought him to be wholly professional, even a bit cool. Of course, she had been frantic with worry over Pearl, so by comparison, anyone would have come across as composed and somewhat detached. She couldn't imagine that man tending to a patient in a brothel. She said, Despite his late night, I hope he maintains office hours tomorrow. I can't drive well enough yet to go into town. You'll have to take us. Sure, sure. Whenever you want to go. First thing after breakfast. She hesitated, then asked if he had any fix-it jobs lined up. A couple? Why? I was thinking that as long as we're in town, and if Pearl isn't too fussy, we could look around, see what might be for rent. He gave her a crooked grin. You're not as smart as you think. I wasn't lying about the old house. I knew of it. Sought out the landlord and talked him into meeting me there after he finished his supper. It's a big old rambling place, but it stood empty for years on account of the back of it is built into a wall of limestone. Built into the rock? He shrugged. Wouldn't take much to make it habitable. I could do the work myself. But if you don't like it... The least I can do is take a look. Thank you, Irv. Don't thank me till you've seen it. The house couldn't be more of a nightmare than this shack she was living in. She appreciated that her father-in-law had listened to the concerns she'd raised with him this morning and had taken her ultimatum seriously enough to act on it. In gratitude, she smiled at him. You look worn out. Try to get some rest. She then retreated behind the partition with Pearl, who had become restless again and was mewling pitiably. 11. Thatcher repeated the sheriff's confounding words. Tell you where Mrs. Driscoll is. He looked over at the man who'd tried to attack him. Are you Dr. Driscoll? Yes, you son of a bitch. And I want to know what you've done with my wife. Nothing but talk to her. Why? What's happened? Sheriff Amos said, she's missing. Missing? It's feared she was abducted from her home sometime between 10 o'clock p.m. and 1 o'clock a.m. Thatcher glanced at the wall clock. It was going on five. He looked at each man in the room in turn, and the reason for their judgmental glowers took on meaning. The hairs on the back of his neck stood on end. That's why I'm here? You think I know something about it? You were seen talking with her today on her porch. I said as much. I was looking for a room to rent. You can ask him. He tipped his head toward the mayor. Mayor Croft told us that he gave you directions to their house. A decision I regret, the man boomed. The sheriff, looking irritated, turned his head partially toward the mayor and said in an undertone, Bernie, I'll handle this. Coming back around to Thatcher, he said, Where do you get the bruises, Mr. Hutton? Your deputy, Harold, there poked me in the face with that pump action. Harold, who was still rifling through his belongings, shot him a dirty look over his shoulder. Not the bruise on your cheek, the sheriff said. The one on your noggin. Oh. He reached up with his cuffed hands and touched the discolored goose egg at his temple. I jumped off a freight train, had a hard landing, rolled down an incline. The sheriff tilted his head and eyed him speculatively. When was that? This morning, early, before dawn. Where? Eight, nine miles, southeast of here, the middle of nowhere. I walked to town. You were bumming a ride? 
Given the circumstances, he felt that admitting to one malfeasance would be to his advantage. Yes. Where were you headed? Amarillo, or as close to there as the railroad goes these days. What's up there? He explained his longtime connection to the Hobson Ranch. I was making my way home, back to the ranch and my job. The sheriff took it all in, then said, If you got a job waiting for you in the panhandle, why'd you jump off the freight train way down here? He came clean about the poker game and the ill will it had created with those sharing the boxcar. They were sore losers. Did you cheat? Sheriff Amos asked. No, I have a knack. For winning at cards? For reading people. The sheriff glanced over at the others, as though to verify that he'd heard correctly. Thatcher could tell that they were all skeptical of his boast, as well as of his story, so he didn't volunteer anything else. When the sheriff came back to him, he said, What happened when you got to the Driscoll's house? I took one look and knew it was out of my reach. He told them about Mrs. Driscoll's coming out onto the porch and catching him as he was about to leave, and saying she wanted to thank him for coming by. She called me up to the porch and brought out some fresh shortbread. The doctor said in a strained voice, At least that much is the truth. Mila baked it this morning. We ate some after supper. She gave me a second piece to take with me, Thatcher said. I wrapped it in my handkerchief. It left a butter stain. You can check it. Right pocket. He raised his cuffed hands, inviting the sheriff to withdraw his handkerchief from the pocket of his jacket. When he shook out the folded cloth, a few crumbs fell to the floor. The greasy spot was clearly visible. That doesn't mean he didn't go back later and do her harm, the mayor said. The sheriff frowned. Doesn't mean he did either. Recalling Mrs. Driscoll's friendly smile and hospitality, it bothered Thatcher to think that she was in a direful situation of any kind. Mrs. Driscoll was as nice a lady as I ever met. We chatted there on the porch while I ate the shortbread. When I took my leave, she suggested I try to find a room at the boarding house. I thanked her and left. If something bad has happened to her, you're wasting your time talking to me. You ought to be out beating the bushes, looking for her. Driscoll surged to his feet. Or maybe we'll beat the truth out of you. Hands fisted, he made a lunge for Thatcher and took a wild swing. Sheriff Amos shot out of his chair. Damn it, Gabe, sit down or it'll be you I'm locking up. The mayor took hold of the doctor's arm and dragged him back to his seat. Can't say as I blame you, Gabe, he said, casting a glare in Thatcher's direction. It's clear he's lying. Thatcher didn't give a damn about that blowhard's opinion. The distraught husband was another matter entirely. I'm telling you the truth, Dr. Driscoll. What call would I have had to repay Mrs. Driscoll's kindness by hurting her? The mayor answered for him. I think you took advantage of her kindness and got her to open the door of her house to you tonight. I didn't, Thatcher said.